Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, the main mathematical new thing in this talk is ridiculously simple, and um, I wonder if I can get away with that at a TV conference. So, um, what I'm talking about is uh, this uh, set of, set of problems. Uh, this is about optimal paths in random environments. Uh, the CD content would be stated in terms of homogenization for stochastic um, Newton Jacobi equations. But in general, you have uh, you have something like this. You, you know, you have um, maybe you are in the, in the Euclidean space, maybe you're in a lattice, uh, maybe there is some direction of time, but maybe not. And you are considering various paths uh, connecting uh, various points, and to each path you assign uh, a cost or uh, action or some, something like that. And that action is determined by um, by the uh, by the geometry of the path itself and also by interactions with the with the environment. So it, it picks up some some penalties from uh, some random penalties from the from the environment. And uh, so the the FPP first passage percolation uh, situation is basically depicted on the left where these points X and Y can be uh, related and like there's there's no there's no special way they are located with respect to each other. So some problems in last passage percolation of last passage percolation type they are more uh, there's some directedness. Maybe there's a time. Maybe there's some directed cone in which you you're considering this path. And so that's that's that situation. So for each path you uh, to each path you assign action. That's a. It's random. And then you find the the optimal path. Um, for broad family of process of of, of these uh, of these problems, there is an optimal path. Uh, so the, sh the path minimizing the action among all these. And again, under broad and conditions, um, it turns out that if these points x and y, uh, if you if you take if you fix one of them and if you take another one to infinity uh, along a certain direction, then there is a, a linear rate. Of growth of the of, of the action, and that is that is written here, right? So you you take maybe one point is zero, then you take direction v, and you take you multiply this direction by by t v, and you take by, by t, and you take the optimal path between these two points, and then you divide by t, and there is a limit uh, that depends only depends on v, uh, and it turns out that it's it's non-random, and these things they they started to appear essentially with these with these papers. Hingman's stability ergodic theorem essentially was designed designed for for this kind of this kind of problems, um, and uh, these people proved uh, the first shape <coughs> uh, limit 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 shape theorem. So if you if you consider all points uh, whose distance because this 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 plays the role of distance often. Uh, so if you consider a ball in this distance, and if you renormalize that ball by uh, by by t, uh, the there is a limit. There is a deterministic limit shape, and that's that's what what they prove. And so it's all related to this linear growth of action. Um, so this is a this is an example of that on on the lattice. Um, so each each lattice node is assigned a random cost, and maybe that's just the the time you spend you spend there if you want to pass through, and you are interested in shortest. Um, the shortest time it takes you to get from maybe from this point to that point. And there, there is a dynamic programming pr procedure that lets you sequentially draw these arrows. And if you mark um, all these points with, with cost below a certain level, uh, then as this number goes to infinity, this, this, this shape gets closer and closer to some limit shape. And uh, um, so one way to interpret this is through these limit shapes, but the other is um, is using these um, these functions, these functions lambda that I mentioned here. So and they are called shape shape functions because they are related to to the limiting shapes. Um, now I will show you several models. Um, probably traditionally they they started doing all these things with discrete lattice models, but if you ask me, um, there's no. They're not, not no more physically 
relevant and continuous continuous models and so this talk I will gradually move from uh, from discrete models into con to continuous models and you know at a <coughs> at the PD conference I don't need to convince you that continuous <laughs> space models are okay <laughs> and so here's here's one um, uh, and this will be an explanation um, a reminder why why these shape functions make sense so suppose you consider the following uh, variational problem in, in a random environment. Uh, so the environment is given, uh, it's, <clears throat> well, first of all, what are the paths? Uh, so this, is, this picture is in one plus one dimension. So one dimension is time, it goes up, uh, and it's discrete. Uh, one dimension is space, and it's uh, continuous, and it's, and it's horizontal. So what are the the missable paths that I'm looking at. Uh, so paths are just functions of functions of time. So at each at each time you you, you know you step to a new point. And uh, what do you pick up from the environment? Uh, so there is some external potential that is that is random, and it is assumed that this uh, external external potential, you know, random potential, it's a stationary field. So its its distribution is invariant under space time shifts. And moreover, let me assume that uh, from one layer to another, the, these are IID, IID copies of the same stationary, stationary process. Um, what is L? So L is the penalty for long jumps, also known as, as the Lagrangian. So it penal, you know, maybe, you know, think of this as, you know, maybe it's quadratic or quartic or something. So, so maybe a good path, an optimal path, you, if you want to minimize, uh, to minimize this action. So you would like to go to places where these Fs are small, uh, but you cannot go like, to every good place because you're penalized by, 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 by these. <coughs> and uh, so this is one situation where uh, Kingman's subedity for Gordic theorem uh, clearly applies. I mean, you have to make some assumptions, but uh, this, uh, this is essentially how it works. You, uh, for each two points, x1 and x2, and for each two times, and one and n2. You, you're defining the optimal action between this, this point and that point at these times. And then, uh, you know, if you look at a picture like this, maybe, uh, the path that connects the starting point to the end point uh, can only, cannot be worse uh, than a concatenation of two paths that connect zero, well, one of those points to some intermediate point, and then, because you have one more restriction here. Uh, and so you have this, as a result that, you know, you have this inequality, and this is the classical, the classical subadditivity uh, situation where you can apply subadditivity for ergodic, th ergodic theorem, and so this limit exists by that, by the theorem, and it's, it's deterministic, it doesn't, um, it doesn't depend on the realization of the, of the environment. Now, of course, this, this limit depends on, uh, depends on this direction V, right? I mean, you take, you fix 1.0, and the other point is v times n at time n. And so you take this point to infinity at, along a certain direction. And uh, well, presumably, uh, well, this will depend depend somehow on on the on the on the direction. But this limit doesn't depend on anything else. So it depends on v, but not not on anything else. And so this is the the shape function that I'm talking about. Now these shape functions have been computed for a number of models. So there is a list, uh, but then. Um, I mean, is it a, is it a long list? It you know it depends uh, how 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 you look at it. So m most of these, uh, all of these exactly, um, all of these situations where we know what what the shape function is, um, they are due to some symmetry of the problem. Um, so for example, for example here, it was the shear uh, shear in, shear invariance, and in in these uh, Euclidean FPP by um, you know, papers by, by Howard Newman, so it was rot rotational invariance of the space. So then things are clearly, um, uh, it's, it's, it's clear what, what it is, because you have, you have Euclidean balls and, and things like that, as limiting shapes. <coughs> and also there are a certain number of models where uh, things are set up so that you can compute things precisely, exactly solvable models. So, so all all these situations they are they fall into these two two classes. Um, but what do we know about shape functions in general? 
So they're always convex. Um, and that's essentially um, the same kind of subadditivity property in a sense, right? Because you, if you want to go from here to there um, with this average slope, and instead you choose to go first with slope V1 and then with slope V2, uh, then um, because this is an, an, extra, an extra restriction, you obtain that the optimal path can, uh, this optimal path will be not worse than, than the concatenation of these two. And so that gives you this uh, inequality and then you just take, take limits and you obtain that, you obtain this convexity, convexity inequality. So all these functions, they're always convex. Um, and so they can look like, like this or like, like, like that. Um, but can you say anything, anything more than that? Uh, convexity doesn't include, doesn't exclude corners or flat edges. But it would be nice to show that these, uh, these convex functions, they actually have no flat edges and, uh, and, co and corners. And uh, it turns out that this is a tricky issue. That, uh, in, in fact, there are, there are some exceptions to this, and I tried to list a few exceptions that are known to me. Um, well, first of all, well, if in the FPP uh, situation, uh, when all there, you know, you can go in, in, all, in all directions, uh, then, you know, the set of admi admissible directions is actually the entire space. And then the, the shape function, it looks, like a, <clears throat> it looks like a cone, right? I mean, because it's, it's like Euclidean, essentially it's like Euclid, Euclidean metric, right? I mean, you, you, it's the same in all, in all, in all directions, in all directions, uh, rotation invariant. And so therefore, uh, therefore you, have, uh, you have a corner at zero. So it's not differentiable at zero, um, never. And also, <clears throat> if you step away from, from the KPZ universality class, it's, it's, it's a little, this notion is a little vague, but if you step away from it, then there are various violations of, um, of strict convexity and of uh, definition and, and no corners, that is differentiability. So in the deterministic uh, homogenization, uh, weak KM theory, so there's this notion of beta function, ma matters uh, beta function, and it's, it's essentially the same as my shape function. And it turns out that uh, it's uh, it's it's not smooth. It's it has corners typically in all rational uh, all rational di di directions. So it's very far from from regular. Also, if you uh, if you step away from, I mean, if you allow slow decorrelation, I mean, we know since this this paper that any convex limit shape well, that respects symmetries of the um, of the of the lattice, if there is a lattice or something like that, so it, it can be. It can be realizable as a uh, as a as a sh as a shape function, and uh, there, then there is there is also these there are these examples where if you allow in lattice models, if you allow distribution of the environment to have atoms, then you can have flat. I mean, you can you can have flat edges, and this is due to some percolation effects. Um, okay, so I'm using this to advertise for a recent paper where we prove for <coughs> an, a curious model uh, that there is a corner and a flat edge uh, for that LPP in a, in a product environment. But let me not go in, in there. But if you if you look uh, at models um, that sort of fall into the KPZ universality class, um, then you you expect or you you see that the the shape function is um, is is nice. It is it looks smooth in simulations and uh, there are there, there are heuristics that sort of connect the KPZ KPZ exponents KPZ, KPZ scalings uh, with the like local quadratic behavior of the of the shape function. So it should be smooth locally. It should it should look like like a, like a parabola. Um, I mean, but this is not this is not rigorous, so there's no theorem like that. But there is this vague understanding that uh, regularity properties of the shape function are related to um, to KPZ, KPZ scalings, and so you can. Uh, this isn't, everybody believes that 
uh, these, these features, uh, con strict convexity, strong convexity, and differentiability in all corners, that these features are universal. So they should, be, they should hold true for a vast collection of models, essentially coinciding with the KPZ universality class. Um, but, there's, but there's a gap in our understanding. So we have just a few models where uh, the shape function is precisely known, and there are these, uh, and so there's a gap between those and, uh, and, this, and, this, and this claim, this claim. These features are supposed to be universal, but we know, know about that only for a handful of, <coughs> of models with symmetries. Um, now, there's more glory in strict convexity. Like if you, uh, that's, it's, it's a, it's, so that's the biggest open, open problem. You know, one, um, once, once we obtain strict convexity, there's, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna help in, um, in a, you know, with, a lot, with a lot of things. Maybe with KPZ universality and in the ergodic program for, uh, for stochastic Hamilton Jacobi equations. Um, but differentiability itself is, 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 is a good thing on, on its own, and it, it also allows to make certain claims in, in, in this direction. Um, so in this talk, um, I will actually give a simple proof of, um, so this is, strangely, this is the first kind of result where I, I, I will give you a family of models where the shape, um, but that, you know, they do not depend on just finitely many parameters. It's, 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 a, it's a large class uh, where the shape function turns out to be differentiable. And so these are, uh, so these minimization problems uh, that I talked, that I already mentioned uh, in zero temperature. So these are, these are really minimization problems. Positive temperature means uh, we, we are considering Gibbs measures instead of so poly polymer measures instead of just <clears throat> minimizers of action. And then uh, we'll talk about Hamilton Jacobi equations, homogenization, and uh, so the uh, differentiability of shape functions are interpreted as effective Lagrangians dual to effective Hamiltonians in this. In this. And then if I have time, I will also mention <coughs> continuous space. Um, I mean, all these, all these are in continuous space, but uh, I will also mention FPP, first passage percolation type models. Um, and I will give you a formula for, uh, for, the, for the gradient. It will be not too horrible, but still not, too, not, too, not super explicit. So first, let me start with a shear invariant case. So this comes from uh, my, my work with, uh, with Eric and Costa here. I introduced this model um, where the where the action where the action depends on. I mean, first of all, this is in both continuous space and time, and these are Poissonian points in space time <coughs> with um, a homogeneous Poisson process. Um, the action consists of two parts. This is the kinetic action. Um, just accumulate the, uh, the, the square of the first derivative, so this is like kinetic energy, and then each Poisson point you visit, it gives you, <clears throat> it gives you contribution of minus one. So it, it's good to pick up a lot of Poisson points if you want to minimize, but, but you cannot pick them all because, because you're, you're, you're penalized. And uh, so this was, um, this model was, was used to, as a, in this action is, is how you solve the stochastic Berger's equation in this uh, in this environment, and I, I, it's a part of the ergodic program for the Berger's equation in the in the unbounded uh, stochastic Berger's equation in the non-compact situ situation. Um, this model, uh, I mean, everything worked in that paper because uh, because this is a shear invariant si situation, and so here's how a shear invariance works. <coughs> So if you start with a path uh, that connects zero at time zero to zero at time t, and then you apply the shear transformation. So basically you add, uh, well, shear in space time is also known as Galilean transformation. So you basically you add, you add constant velocity to, to, the, to, the, to the path. So let's do that, 
and let's also um, let's also apply the shear to the environment. So let's take all these Poisson points and also apply the shear transformation to them. Um, so the is this is the same uh, is the same Poisson points that uh, that the path that the path passes through, right? So it pass it passes through these, but then because we transform the space time together with the path. These are images of the same of the same point, so the potential part of the action doesn't doesn't change. So how does the kinetic part changes? How does how does it change? Well, it's this simple cal calculation. You know, for probabilities, it's like what what happens if you add how do you compute the variance for like shifted random variable or something? And, um, so it's it's an extremely simple com computation, right? So let's compute the kinetic action of this. You just write it out. You expand. And then this integral is equal to zero because, because path gamma connects zero to zero. So the total integral is supposed to be, the total increment is, is, is zero. And so then the action of the new path is the old action plus this deterministic number, t, tv, tv squared. And so it means that uh, if we know how actions behave for, for paths connecting zero to zero, then we, we also know how they, how they behave uh, for x for, for paths connecting zero to to v to n v or t t t v, um, well because the Poisson point process is distribution invariant, right? Right. I mean, we apply the shear transformation, <coughs> and the the areas are preserved, so the distribution of the Poisson process is, is distributionally is the same the same thing. Uh, so so you can you can compute the this is a new way to compute the sh the shape function. You can start with just looking at paths connecting zero to zero and just apply these, these transformations. So this gives you this, the shape function is precisely a parabola with this unknown constant though. And that's super nice, like that's the best convex function you can, you can have. Uh, that, that, that really helps because then when you can derive some estimates on how straight the path is and some estimates on, um, on the fluctuations, uh, ex exponents, stuff like that. Um, and this works for all uh, models where you have something quadratic in the um, in the action. So let's let's look at this one. It's it's sort of simpler. Um, it doesn't appear in any paper, I think, um, but it's a nice it's a nice model where um, uh, maybe don't look at this, but look look at this instead. So there are Poisson points at uh, at each at each layer. So now now the time is discrete, and uh, each uh, for each time, there is a Poisson po process with constant intensity, with the same intensity on each of those lines. And I require my paths to pick up a Poisson point at each, at each layer. So it, it has to go, to go through there. So this is sort of like a, <clears throat> maybe, your, maybe your um, potential is, uh, is zero at, at, at these points and plus infinity at all other points. Or you can, or you can have, uh, you can have just this this term, and then you have a. At each layer, you have an, um, you have a stationary process, and these are these are IID from 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 layer to to the to layer. Um, um, so for the but for for this for this version with the, uh, with the Poisson points, actually, I mean this is. This is a digression. This is a step, step aside. The, the limit shape is is nice, uh, and so I just wanted to show you this this picture. So it turns out that because the shape function is quadratic, the um, the limit shape is um, is an ellipse, which is which is sort of cute. Okay, so now I can now I can state the uh, the general the general. Um, a general result for this kind of models where uh, we have we have action. So once again, so this is this is sort of kick forcing case in terms of stochastic PDEs. You apply the random potential at each integer time. All these are assumed to be IID in this theorem. L is um, it's Lagrangian, and not much is assumed of it. So it's in this theorem, it's assumed to be C2. It should be sort of coercive. Um, and there should be some control on the second derivative at, at infinity. 
And so it doesn't have to be convex. It's, uh, you know, all functions like this can, can, can work like, you know, so these are polynomials with leading coefficient one um, of even order. Um, it can be exponential. It's, it, there's a huge variety of those um, that, that work. And, and the conclusion of this theorem is that there is a, I mean, okay, so there is a convex uh, shape function, so that's, that's not new, but the new thing is that it's, it's differentiable. This is the definition, and then this, the deterministic function that is sort of defined by this <coughs> turns out to be differentiable, and the derivative is, is given by this simple formula. Uh, so in this formula, what is this? Um, so gamma is the, gamma uh, is the optimal path uh, that travels from zero times zero to nv at time at time n. So interestingly, uh, there is no f in this in this formula. It sort of fact, factors out, and that's the result of uh, stationarity. Now, <clears throat> the proof is not is not hard um, actually. It's sort of ridiculously, <laughs> embarrassingly simple. But before doing uh, the actual proof, so let me introduce, let, let me first claim that shears are still useful. So the main trick in this, um, now proof, is to, is to apply, is to apply shear. So once again, you know, you maybe you start with a path that connects zero to zero, and you make a path that connects zero to, to Vn at time n. And you apply the shear. Now the problem is, of course, that now we are not in the quadratic situation, and this is, you know, there's no algebraic nice properties of this. So in the quadratic case, you know, you would expand this as, as, I, as I did, and things just work out super nicely. Here, no, it's, it's not algebraically nice. You will have terms, and, um, but still it turns out that it makes sense to work with this, with this expression. And the reason for that is that uh, somehow you may, you may use the same path um, to estimate optimal actions for various uh, V, because it's, it's, it's really in the same, in the same environment that can, it can connect zero to zero. So instead of changing the endpoint, now I will change my action. Um, so as V, as V changes, I will not change the endpoint. Instead, I will change the, the action in this way. That's the main idea. Um, and because, because the, well, this action, the interaction is not shear invariant, but this process F is, right? Because there's, these are independent uh, stationary processes, so we apply the shear, it's, it's still the same, the, same uh, the same process. And that's why the, um, the distribution of these, of these optimal actions is the same as the distribution of the, of the old optimal actions. In a sense, this is a change of change of coordinates, and so you can compute the lambda using using this new um, uh, this new action. And it's may, maybe it's not obvious, uh, uh, but actually, these new these new actions in the in the sheared sheared in, <laughs> environment these are much nicer than the old ones. And um, so, let me try to convince you. So imagine that you have this point this this model with the so the Poisson points at, at each layer, <coughs> and well, maybe your action is, is quartic like this. And so this is what you get in a simulation. It, is, this, is this a smooth function? Is this strictly convex? I mean, does it approximate? Well, may, maybe. But you, what you see is sort of the typical KPZ behavior. So this is for the, this is for the original action, right? So I mean, I, I, would, I would fix uh, for each v, I would take n v and compute this. So I'm, I'm, I was changing the endpoint here. But if I change the action and, con and connect zero to zero instead, this is this is the graph that you get. <coughs> so <laughs> this is much more convenient. You know, looking at this, you would be my, you know, it's, it's easier to get convinced that thing, things be, should be extremely uh, extremely regular. Um, now this is actually this is not smooth. Because this is piecewise, uh, piecewise smooth. Because you know we had this, um, uh, we had um, this quartic action, and it turns out it's sort of obvious that the same in the, in, in that model, the same path, it works not just as an as a minimizer, not just for one value of v, but for a for a whole range 
values of it, right? Because there are, um, I mean, in this model, uh, where is it? Where is it? You know, the collection of paths is discrete. So, you know, you, you choose between finitely many of them. So, you know, if you found a good path for some V, uh, then probably for nearby Vs, it's gonna, it's gonna work as well. And actually, it turns out to be super true. So these are all optimal paths that that uh, that realize optimal actions for this for this picture. So, I mean, okay, you know, they are not. Um, there, are many, there are many places where they where they go together, um, but this is this is uh, the construction for like you know for all these endpoints. Um, I mean, for all for all for all values of v between. Um, be honest, well, between between one and and minus one, but this is with you know with huge precision. <clears throat> now, in the quadratic case, there would have been just one, right? Because this the same the same same path works for all shared shared environments. Uh, for the quartic or for any anything else, there would be these, uh, but not there are not too many of them. So the way it works is that the, these this approximation to the shape function is constructed of pieces of, of, of cortex. It's like, like a festoon or something. Okay, so, so what's, what's the proof? So let's, <coughs> let's get to uh, business. So the, the whole point of this proof is that I can use, I can use the optimal path for one V to estimate uh, the optimal action for nearby values of the uh, from, from from the above, and uh, my my goal is actually to obtain that because I'm I'm after differentiability. I want to prove that the derivative on the right is the same as the derivative on the on the right derivative is equal to the left derivative. That's 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 all I need, and this is how it's done. So suppose I want to to deal with uh, some with the value of w that's close to v. Um, I don't know what the optimal action is, but I know that if I stick in uh, the optimal path for v, uh, this is an upper estimate. Like this is the optimal. This is the result of the optimal path, and this is you know this path is only suboptimal maybe. And then you just tailor expand this. Um, to, you, you you tailor expand this near v um, in terms of w, and so you write out what the action is. And it looks like, uh, like this. And at this point, f the random contributions they 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 vanish because because the, the because the action doesn't <coughs> you know, because the potential part of the action um, here it doesn't this part it doesn't depend on v so in, so in that Taylor expansion there, there's no there's no f at all which is nice because then. Um, Okay, so here let me make one more assumption. Um, let me let me just pretend that the second derivative of L is um, is bounded by a constant c. I mean, in, in reality, you know, uh, the theorem works for much broader uh, class of Ls. But um, remember, there was this condition that the second derivative was controlled by by L, it's, L, it's, L itself at infinity, and so you cannot accumulate a lot of L. Hence, you can you cannot accumulate to a lot of a lot of L second derivatives. So anyway, so you have this Taylor expansion, and then you you divide by both both sides by by this n times w minus v. Now to retain this this inequality sign, you have to uh, have to well. So this works only for w minus v positive. So w is on the right of v. And the next slide will be. Will concern the the reverse inequality. So you you just you just have this, um, and then you you take limit of both sides, and on the left on the left you just convert. This is just the limit, right? So these converge to this converges to lambda of w. This converges to lambda of v. On the right hand side you have this limit, um, and then after that you take w to v. And this ratio converges to the right derivative of lambda at v. And on the right hand side, this goes to zero, and you just have limit of this. Then you do the same thing on the left, uh, and the inequality changes 
the direction. Right, so. <laughs> and so, so you divide it by W minus V, but it was negative, so now it's, this inequality is now um, greater than or equal, and, but the same thing holds, holds true. And as a result, you obtain that the left derivative is greater than lim soup of the same thing. Now, uh, the right derivative is, is less than or equal to lim inf, which is less than or equal to lim soup, which is less than or equal to the left derivative. But we know that lambda is convex, and so the left derivative is less than or equal to the right derivative. And uh, and this is it, right? This is this is this is the entire proof. So it means that these two derivatives coincide, and they're equal to the common value of this liminf and lim soup. So it must it means that there is a limit, right? So this both of these coincide, and they are equal to, to this thing. So this is in the um, sort of sheared coordinates, and then you can go back to to the, to the original path, and then you recover this expression for the gradient <coughs> from. <laughs> From the original theorem. So, so this is a this is all. This is this is this is all it takes. So I, I don't know. The lesson I guess is that, um, you know, people are obsessed with uh, lattice models, but it turns out that it's easy to, to differentiate and use very basic convex analysis in the in the continuous variables. Um, so the remainder of the talk is is basically um, well. Okay. All oh, right. So there's there's this slide. Um, I mean, it's tempting, you know, if you look at this, maybe because there's more glory in, uh, in strict convexity uh, than differentiability. Um, it's tempting to say, well, maybe this points in the direction of strict convexity because, uh, because as, v, as, v grow, say, as V grows, you will pick, you know, more and more of the... I mean, assume that L is L is a convex function, so its derivative is mono is monotone. So as V grows, you should pick more and more of like larger values of L. Um, and so you would have something like this. But say you know if if L is quartic, then its derivative, well, this is supposed to be V as well. Um, its derivative is like V to the V cubed, right? And so the average value of the, I mean, so the 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 gradient according to this formula is like it's like the third, third moment of this, but you cannot control third moment with first moment, right? So the first moment we know is, is equal to V. Um, so as V grows, it would be nice if we would be able to say that this also grows, but, but we, we can't. Okay, so the rest of the, of the talk is, is the discussion of, I guess a quick discussion, a very quick discussion of uh, where this method works um, as, as well. So for, for positive temperature case, um, instead of minimizing the action, you consider the, the Gibbs distribution on paths connecting two points. And so that's, these, these are known as polymer measures. Um, and it turns out that the same, the same approach works. So you introduce these polymer measures, and the object of interest is free en this free energy density, or average, average free Free energy, so this really play, play, plays the role of the of the optimal action, and uh, you know this is subadditive, and uh, and there is there is there is a limit, and we prove that under a little more, uh, a few more assumptions, uh, this 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 limit, um, the shape function, uh, <clears throat> is differentiable at all points v, and uh, there is a formula. Like this, so here, this is the averaging of uh, of this average with respect to the polymer measure connecting zero to n v at some at some n. Um, so this is essentially the proof. But maybe uh, because I don't have a lot of time, I'll skip this because my my goal now is to show you a few situations where essentially, I mean, you will believe me that this this is this is going to work in in in, in similar uh, uh, situations. So now this is this is the situation where you have sort of an honest Hamilton Jacobi equation with uh, with random with random potential uh, because these equations they are they're solved with variational with a variational principle axolenic uh, formula uh, and 
Well, maybe you, you noticed that in the previous, in the, in the version of the argument that I already showed you, <coughs> it was important that the, uh, the noise, the, uh, the random potential, it was white in time. So it was ID from layer to layer, and that was in charge of this property that when I apply the shear, the resulting process is still, uh, it has the same distribution. So that seems to be, to be an important ingredient. But here is the situation where it's, not, it's, it's no longer the case. So I will have a potential that is not shear invariant itself. I will consider potential that is of this, of this kind. So this is sometimes known, uh, some people call this the shot, shot noise. Anyway, it's a model of point influences. You have Poissonian points, and uh, on top of each Poisson point, you, you put a cap or a, you convolve Poisson points with some <coughs> smooth functions with compact support. This, the function can be, uh, can be random. So for each point, you can sort of sample its own, um, its own uh, kernel. And still, in this situation, it turns out that, that there is a limit of um, I'm, I'm running ahead of myself. So this is, these, these are requirements on, on L. So it's still some cursivity is assumed and also a control on, of, um, of the secondary, of, of the Hessian and at, the <coughs> at infinity. And then um, this, this slide describes how, uh, how this is, how this optimal action solves the, uh, the hamilton Jacob equation. Uh, we are, this is the dual uh, Legendre dual of, of the uh, of the of AL. and so the shape th uh, theorem uh, says says the same thing that there is a I mean obviously there is a sh a shape function but we also we say that it's is, is differentiable and uh, we we give a formula for the uh, for the gra for the gradient and it turns out that I mean so the 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 process is the process is not shear invariant, but it's if you apply the shear, uh, you can couple the new process to the original process, and the, the and you can you can control the control the change. So it's that that cartoon says the same. And right, right, right. I should I should I should now just mention that these are all all papers that are known to me about hamilton jacobi equation homogenization. Um, and uh, and also, I just want to mention that <coughs> that also these things work for for FPP. So if you have random Riemannian metric like this, or if you have some model, some FPP model, um, sort of ala Howard Newman, uh, then you also have this uh, uh, smoothness of the of the sh of the shape function of the of the homogenized homogenized uh, front uh, in in FPP. So there are there are some some open problems, but I'll I'll leave it at, at that. Sorry, sorry for taking. Thank you very much.